We're here at syndicatednews.net, and we're so happy to have Paulo Coelho visiting Syndicated News. Paulo, are you there with us? Yes, I am here. Hello, how are you, Ruth? We're so happy to have you join syndicatednews.net. It's wonderful. I just came across a message where you are saying that the Pope should stick to spiritual matters and not mention whether or not we should wear condoms or when. That was fascinating that you would actually say that. Yeah, yeah. Well, first of all, I'm a Catholic myself, so I think that I can talk about my church. I would not, never talk about any other religion, but being a Catholic myself and seeing the Pope that it is dear, some, I don't understand why he's doing this, because you don't have selective condoms, you know? You can use condoms with prostitutes, <laughs> but you cannot use condoms with, with your wife so it is a little bit fuzzy it is a bit, little bit complicated and I thought to myself I should uh, say something about it because I don't understand this Pope I really don't understand he should concentrate himself in spiritual matters more than in anything else I agree my next question is I'm looking around at something as simple as Wikipedia which classifies and categorizes all sorts of work from all over the world, and it's become the Internet Encyclopedia. And I'm looking up The Alchemist, and I was shocked. Oh, by the way, I found the first edition cover. It's a beautiful edition. Now. So we've added it to our carousel of pictures on syndicatednews.net. It's on the front page. We used the English cover, the Chinese cover, and the original Alchemist book cover. We have all three and a photo of yourself. Great, and great, it great. it says, for those that aren't aware, this is the 20th anniversary of The Alchemist. It is true. The 20th is true. anniversary. And even though the critics were saying one thing or another, the book was sold word of mouth all over the world. Yeah, but it did not start like this. Uh, Tell when us the about Alchemist... the start. Tell us about that. Yeah, the, the, start, the starting point is that when I published The Alchemist, it is my second book. My first book is on my pilgrimage to Santiago de Compostela. That's called The Pilgrimage. So when I published The Alchemist, the first book, The Pilgrimage in Brazil, we are talking about Brazil, well was okay, sold 3,000 copies. Then I published The Alchemist and did not sell at all, at all. At the end of one year, it has sold less than 900 copies. So my publisher said, oh, this book is never going to work. Here are your contracts, and we don't want to publish it anymore. And, oh. And, and, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I was devastated because it was a turning point in my life. It was when I decided to stop thinking about being a writer and start writing. And in the, in the Alchemist, there is a sentence that says, when you want something, the whole universe conspires to help you. And I said, I want badly to be this writer, and I cannot just quit because someone published the book and the book did not work. Let me start knocking doors again which I did. And one publisher in Brazil said, well, let's give a second chance. And he did. No promotion, no publicity, nothing. And slowly, word of mouth, the book starts selling. I could easily, you know, when I look back now and I say, oh, I could easily quit my good fight when the first publisher said no, but I'm glad that I did it. I'm glad that I read my own books and that I trust the messages that are there. <laughs> <laughs> and, and now The Alchemist is over 65 million copies. And in Wikipedia, also it is classified as one of the uh, best-selling books of all time. Of all time? Yeah, yeah, yeah. They, they have a list of the 50 best-selling books of all time. And The Alchemist is there. And one of the closing paragraphs that Wikipedia uses, I want to quote because it was just so charming. It says, this book was not supported by high marketing budgets in the first few years after publication. It was not written in French or Spanish at the time, and it did not enjoy a film tie-in. It wasn't even recommended by positive reviews from the media, but it is still selling, only relying on word of mouth as its main marketing tool. That is a telling statement. That is something that is really the only way that you can sell a book. If you go to a New York Times best-selling list now, The Alchemist is there. Uh, breaking all the records, you know, and it was published in the U.S. 
1993. So uh, at the end of the day, who rules the market? It is the reader. The reader. And the reader, the reader. You can see a lot of promotion. You can see a lot of things. But if you don't have word of mouth, if the reader does not like your book, it is impossible to sell a single copy. However, if the reader likes your book, like in my case, not only he helps you in, in promoting your book, but also to have the alchemist and all my books, and I'm really telling all my books, translated in 71 languages. Mm -hmm. Also, it's the reader who says, oh, this book is fantastic. It should be in English. It should be in Spanish. And then I did not have any experience in, in international market, and today it is translated in 71 languages. Wikipedia also mentions that this book has made it to the top spot on bestseller lists in 74 countries. Yeah, yeah, that's correct. Yes, yes. And you've won well, awards in Germany and Italy? I got quite a few awards, which is very important. But again, this came after the reader promoted the book. So if I have to say something, I would say thank you to my readers because they were always there for me, not only for The Alchemist, but for all my books. And now word of mouth is promoting your other books as well. All of them. Every time that I release a book, it goes straight to the top. And then, of course, some books last more than other books, but yes, the reader is always there giving me another chance. Uh, at the end of the day, the reader can forgive a book that he does not like. What the reader cannot do is forgive a book that he sees there is a formula. So every time that I write a new book, I write really a new book. I don't try to repeat The Alchemist. I can write about prostitution like I did in 11 minutes my second best-selling book. Oh, I can write about madness, like I did if Veronica decides to die, because I was in a mental institution when I was very young. I read that because your parents couldn't manage you. They thought that basically your creativity was mental illness and kept locking you up and you kept running away. Yeah, 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 yeah. I was in this mental institution for three times. You know, my father wanted me to be an engineer like him. I was this rebellious person who wants to be a writer. And he said, but nobody can make a living out of writing. And I said, well, but this is not important. You know, I want to be happy. I want to do something that is meaningful for me in my life. So when they got really desperate, they tried everything. They tried blackmailing me with money, with everything. <laughs> Like, well, I want to be a writer, and my parents, is, they were desperate, so they wanted me to be an engineer like my father. I, I want to be a writer. And, of course, the first uh, thing that they said was, nobody can make a living out of writing. And I said, but, well, it's not about make a living out. It is about being happy or being fulfilling your task in life. So they tried everything. They tried to black me. They tried to cut all the money that they gave me at that moment. But I insisted. So in a desperate act of love, I must insist on that because they only want me to be a person who could make a living. They did not want to harm me, but they were so desperate that they put me in a mental institution three times. And then, uh, of course, I, I escaped three times. And one day they said, okay, my poor son will never be capable of surviving this world, but it is enough probably three times. Now we're going to support him. And then, well, and then they stopped putting me in this mental institution again and again and again. Good. My father is still alive. Oh, wonderful. Um, How old is he? Yeah. How old is he now? My father was born in 1914, so he is 96. Oh. And my mother died uh, 10 years ago. Yeah, they were able to see it. But it is so abstract, this type of success. Because even for me, huh, today we were checking. There was an audit in how many books did I sell. And it is close to 140 million copies. That makes wow. five, uh, yeah, more than half a billion people as readers because the average readership for one book is three people. 
And that is so complicated to imagine that half a billion people read your books. So even for me, it's quite difficult to understand my own success. Well, one thing that I notice that's a strength through your work and interviews and your biography is your statement that when you want to do something, the universe conspires to help you succeed, which sounds to me very much like the laws of attraction and the secret. Yeah, 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 absolutely. Uh, the Secret is a book that was published a few years ago, but I believe that we are all connected. It is the classic art of alchemy. Everything is one thing only. I believe that we belong to this dream of God and that you can interfere in a positive way, also in a negative way, but normally in a positive way, to fulfill your dreams. The problem with people who are scared, this was also my problem, to fulfill dreams. I tell you why. I only wrote my first book when I was 40 years old, even if I knew that my dream was to be a writer. When you are fighting for your dreams, of course you are going to be defeated. And then you cannot blame anybody. You cannot blame your boss. You cannot blame the situation. And it hurts. And I've been defeated several times. And it hurts. But at least I know that I'm fighting for something that is meaningful to me. And you try to avoid this situation. You try to avoid because it is easy to put the blame in someone else. So that's why it took for me so long to fulfill my dream. I start writing when... Many of my friends were getting prepared to retire. And many people that I know, they also say, oh, it's not yet the time, I have to wait. There is no time. The time is now. Start now. And face your defeats and face your difficult moments. But at least this will be meaningful to you. This will be something that you are doing because you want to do, not because someone is imposing on you to do. And I wanted to mention to the public that The Alchemist is not only available all over the world, but it's absolutely available on Paulo Coelho's links on his websites, and you can find them on blogtalkradio.com slash syndicated news, and you can also buy it on our syndicated news on the page of this segment, on Blog Talk Radio segment. Yes, but I hope it is available from Vietnam to, to Cambodia. <laughs> we are also able to broadcast out of Hong Kong from mainland China. And we'll talk about that later. This is a whole new world. There are billions of people in China that read in English even. Not only it is translated in Chinese, but I visited China. Uh -huh. I went to Beijing, Nanjing, and Shanghai. Super country, a fantastic country. People were very, very open. I had this possibility to arrive in China, uh -huh. knowing that my soul was there before. So people read my book, and oh. uh, when I arrived there, yes. uh, they knew me. So it was easy to connect to people, and I, I could see a China that probably not everybody can, because my readers were my guides. Oh, that is beautiful. Now, I want to talk about your other books. Which ones are you the most attached to? To. Well, books are like babies. Exactly. Uh, that's it, why I asked the question. <laughs> you normally attach it to the baby baby, mm -hmm. <laughs> to the newborn, but all of them are product of my love, uh, this necessity that we have to share something. It is so important to share because this is part of the human condition. It is to share. If I am in the most beautiful place on earth, at the top of Himalayas, looking at this beautiful sunset, and I'm alone, that would be horrible. It would be devastating, because I don't have someone by my side to say, look, it is so beautiful. But if I am in the ugliest place on earth, like, uh, let's say, a train station, and, and I am with someone that I love, it would be so fantastic to have someone by your side. So, at the end of the day, my books is my way of sharing my soul so I am very fond of all of them. Having said that, I believe that there is a book that I, that, well, two books. One is The Alchemist, because it opened the doors all over the world. But the second one is my first book, The Pilgrimage, that tells my journey. I walked from France to Santiago de Compostela in Spain. It was a kind of rite of passage. And it was by then that I decided to write. 
And it was my turning point. So I should always thank my first book well, for representing my the turning point of my life. And I wanted to ask you about Brida. Brida. Brida is my feminine side. <laughs> this is my second. Yes, yes. This is my second, my second pilgrimage. It was in 1989, to be precise. And we always have this masculine and this feminine side within ourselves. But we men, let alone we South American men, we don't accept that we need to use logic, yes, but we also need to use intuition. You also need to be open to the universe and rely on your sixth sense. So sometimes when you face a tough decision, and the, your logic gives you two options that are good. The only way to sort out the best option is, is through your intuition. So when I did this pilgrimage in 1989, I was, well, with my masculine side very well developed, but I still did not listen to my heart, to my heart as I listen today. And then it was this turning point. I met this girl and she started telling me about these classic traditions that we see going back to the past and they are so much alive as they are today and I start learning about these traditions and the book is about this they call it Wicca, witchcraft it's not about it it is about the language of signs the language of omens that somehow if you look to a symbol the symbol speaks directly to your soul and you understand sometimes much more than if you read a sentence explaining the same thing. That's fascinating. Give me a minute on Veronica. Veronica decides to die is about how the society or the system it tries to make us the same. And I think that we are all different. We are really all different. And so it takes place in a mental institution. I was in this mental institution three times where they try to make people comply to sometimes some rules that we don't understand. But otherwise you are seen like a mad, like crazy. I believe that we are all crazy. I was in this mental institution three times. And when I left, I had at least one thing to tell to myself, Paulo, now that you are crazy, you can do anything because you can never, <laughs> never run for presidency <laughs> because the one day they are going to come with this file. Oh, this candidate was in a mental institution. As I was crazy, I could do anything except running for president. I have no, no political ambitions. So we should awake this craziness within ourselves even if we should behave like normal people, but this craziness in our eyes, in our attitudes, to help us to go beyond our limits. We need to respect some ethics and never do something that goes against your neighbor, but besides that, you're free to choose. And Veronica to die, Decides to Die is, is this book about to be free to choose what you want to choose in life. And I need to ask you, the devil and Miss Prim, this is normally a question of ethics. No, are we good? Are we evil people? This is a question that it depends. You see now, for example, nice people from a countryside, a small town in America, and they go to Iraq or to Afghanistan, and the situation changes them, and they are capable of doing things that normally they will never dream to do. So the situation, the circumstances are, are very tough on us and we have to be very close to our soul in order to control our impulses. We all have our impulses to do something that does not respect ethics. The devil in Miss Spring is about self-control. It is about the devil, a man who arrives in a city and has an indecent proposal. And at the very beginning, people say, oh, no, 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 we are nice people, we are good people. But then, if you really want to force people to do something against their own ethics, this is what uh, the devil in Miss Spring is about. There are always ways to, to do it. And people start reacting, and at the end, they start being seduced by the situation. I myself, I'm always facing this, this dilemma, 
because being a successful author, being a person as I am today, you are always facing temptations. This is not bad because it tests your soul 24 hours a day. But if you have self-control, if you really understand your task, you can overcome all these temptations. And I have to ask you, and we can cut it out later if you don't care for it, but I have to ask, tell me about your personal life. Are you married? Are you single? Are you divorced? Do you have children? All those things. We're dying to oh, know. Don't cut, don't <laughs> cut my personal life from this interview. <laughs> Some people, after they answer the questions, they say, no, I don't want to involve my personal life. No, no, no. Díganos well, my todo. Per- Cuéntenos. Tell us. <laughs> tell us. My personal, my personal life, there is an, a biography that it is published in English and Spanish, well, several languages. So when I read my biography, uh-huh. it was then that I understood my personal life because it is a disaster. It is. I I was in everything, you know. I well, being a hippie, I was on drugs. Being a uh, being a hippie, also I was in every type of of crazy things uh, at that moment. So my personal life was always a turmoil. Something that I was living. I was not trying to understand. And one day they published this biography, and I started reading the biography. And uh, I was very surprised. Of course, the biography stick to facts, things that happen, that can be proven. So I cannot sue the biographer. <laughs> <laughs> but it does not show your spiritual evolution. But I read and I said, this is Paulo, but at the same time, this is not me. So today I married for years. Yeah, my fourth wife, but my last wife, I hope. <laughs> I, I've, I've been married before. It did not work. We, of course, they loved me. I loved them. But since I met my wife in 1979, we've been married. And like any marriage, is has ups and downs. But this shows that the marriage is alive. So my marriage is very much alive. And I live in Rio. And I have an apartment in Europe. So to facilitate traveling. Huh? Beautiful. Now, is it in Paris or Switzerland or both? Where do you live actually uh, yeah, when you're in yeah, Europe? Yeah. Don't they? Normally, I house in the Pyrenees, and I live in the Pyrenees, totally isolated. I'm not this type of person who socializes a lot. Mm-hmm. I love my solitude. I love to be alone with my wife, and we walk every day, and I do archery, and I'm uh, probably I'm, I'm too much into Internet because I Wonderful. have my space. Okay, yeah, it is wonderful, but sometimes you really lose uh, the dimension of, of the thing. So I have close to 4 million uh, friends in Facebook, I have over 1 million friends in Twitter, and I have my blog that I update myself. People are so surprised, and they, they say, do you have time to do this? And I said, I, I have all the time in the world. I'm not busy at all. I'm, when you are doing something, really uh, enjoying Every day is a holiday, and it is my case. So I go there, I talk to my readers. Internet allowed me this possibility to talk to readers from Tanzania to Trondheim. And then basically, this is my life. I wake up around 9 o'clock in the morning, and I go and I walk a minimum of two hours a day. And then I go back to Internet, and I walk a little bit more, and then I, I read towards a normal life. And I need to ask. The year. What motivated that? What inspired you? The year is this obsession that you have. It's totally different from your personal legend, from your personal bliss. That it is when you want something, you, the whole universe conspires to help you. This is when you want something. But when you want something else, meaning you want something from other people, then you have to be very careful because you get this obsession. Oh, I have to example. This person should love me. And this is against ethics. This is against the golden rule that you never can demand something from other people that they don't feel like giving you. So this idea was this moment that I felt like writing a book on obsessions, that it is totally different from a book on the power of your will, of your decision. And I used a man who loses his wife. Then I used a writer to portray the man, a writer who is very close to me, 
probably I also need to think about my career and, and about my life. So I was writing using this writer as a guideline, which does not mean that my wife ever left me. But the writer that is there is facing the same proposition and situations that I face on a daily basis. That's lovely. And La Quinta Montagna, the fifth mountain. The Fifth Mountain was a book that did not sell very well. It was a book that I published in 1996. And for me, it is a very important book because it is a book about um, destruction and rebuilding yourself. Rebuilding yourself with the child that you have within and with the old person, the old soul that you also have within. Uh, so I took uh, Lebanon, as, as not Lebanon as it is today, but I took Phoenicia as, as the background of the story, and I wrote about destruction and rebuilding. For my surprise, this book did not do well, and it was back in 1996. And I said, probably my career is over, but this was the book that I want to write. And eventually, one day, they're going to understand this book. So far, it's, it's the book of mine that did, did not sell very well. That's then, but this is now. And I would highly recommend that people go out and buy that book, The Fifth Mountain, Thank you. and learn Thank you. what he was trying to say then because it's just as applicable now. Actually, it's more applicable now. I think you wrote probably. this book before it's time. I think that's what happened. It, it happens. It happens. Probably, probably, because we, we are in this process of rebuilding well our society after so many crises, so many complicated situations, terrorist attacks, and manipulation of ourselves and all through the government. But we are in the, in the process of reevaluating our, our lives, and The Fifth Mountain is, is a book about this. And I think what happened was you just wrote it too soon, because those events that you allege or suggest in The Fifth Mountain are happening now. Absolutely, absolutely. So it was prophetic. <laughs> it was prophetic. And I think people should go. And sometimes you write about how the universe will help you. And I know that that's true because I use that skill myself. Believe it or not, I willed Paulo Coelho to say yes to me. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I did. I willed it. And every day I would look at his picture. Every day. And one day Good. I got, yeah, one day I got the email that said, Yes, he will be coming on for so much time on this day. You have to use this link. And I was thinking, oh, it works again. It works. <laughs> <laughs> so you you are a living proof of, of the, that it works. But yes. I tell you why not. I don't grant many interviews. Tell me why. Sometimes, yeah, because first, at the very beginning, we said that to promote a book, we need word of mouth, period. Mm -hmm. huh? The only thing that I have to do is to tell the readers, or the publishing house has to tell the readers, well, the book is out, and then the reader goes and buy and promotes or don't promote, like it happened with the fifth mountain. So eventually I can talk about me, about my life, about the current state of the society. I am a messenger of peace of the United Nations, so I'm very committed to things that are concerned to, to peace nowadays. I've been arrested and tortured in Brazil in 1974, three times, so I'm very committed also to human rights because I myself experienced in my, in my flesh and in my soul also uh, what it means to be arrested and tortured. So when the, the subject is this, of course, I'm there and I have to voice out my opinion. I haven't said that in an interview about my life. Well... It can be interesting. You are making my life very interesting. But <laughs> well, well, sometimes there's not nothing, nothing. Y no sé cuándo nos vamos a conocer en persona. Quizás Nueva York, quizás Europa. You never know. You never know. Whenever you want. Now then, my next question, which is very dear to your heart, is the Paulo Coelho Institute. In 1996, everybody always have this idea. I have to do something to help other people. But this is a very vague idea. First, because you are sometimes not even in a position to help yourself, let alone other people. 
But when I start making money out of my books, I said, it is time now to do something for Brazil. Then I said, what can I do for Brazil? Brazil is such a big country, close to 200 million people. I can't, I can't do anything for Brazil. I can't do anything for Rio de Janeiro, that it is my, my, my state. I can't do anything for Copacabana, that it is my neighborhood, my neighborhood. But I can do something for my street. At the end of my street, there is a favela, there is a slum city. And so you have this contrast between very rich people who live in the seashore and very poor people in the mountains. So I said, let's start working with this group here. And my wife and I, we went there and we create the institute that, is basically t that basically takes care of people that did not have a chance in life. So what we try to do is to give this children and teenagers a chance. We take care of 430 children, although the ideal would be 800 children. But we are there, we take the children when they are two or three months old, and we go and follow the children up to 16 years old. We have children from drug dealers, we have children from hardworking people, and we believe that these children are going to change their families. We don't take the children 24 hours a day. They are there from 8 o'clock in the morning up to 5 o'clock in the afternoon. And also, we ask them to pay a symbolic fee, like $1 per month. So they understand that they have a responsibility, and if they cannot pay $1 per month, they will work on the buildings that we have there. They will clean. They will do something that is needed. But so far, we in this past 14 years, we took care of over uh, over 4,000 children, and this is for me a blessing. A blessing to be able to do something, if not for my country, at least for my street. That is a beautiful effort. I congratulate you for that. And I have to ask because the the title of this book is so compelling. By the River Piedra, I sat down and wept. Tell us about yeah. that. This is also a book that deals with my feminine side. Uh, the title is based in, in a psalm. By the rivers of Babylon, I sat down and wept. And I said, well, let me use this verse because it is about our logical side always trying to take control of everything in our lives. So I use a woman that is very independent, does not need anybody, can take care of herself, and I use a man that she falls in love, and by falling in love, everything changes. When we fall in love, when we're committed to love, we give the best of ourselves, and by giving the best of ourselves, we not only change ourselves, we discover, to begin with, we discover that we have so much light within, that it is only a matter of putting this light visible. And the second thing, we start caring for people and things that are around us. Like you see the planet today, people don't pay that much attention to the planet. But if you are in this energy of love, you are going to take care of the planet, you are going to take care of your beloved one, and above all, you are going to take care of yourself. Because from the moment that you love yourself, you can love other people. And it's not that many people that love themselves. So they think they do, but to love yourself is really to commit yourself to fulfilling your dreams, to take some risks in your life, to do whatever you feel like you should do for justifying your presence in this planet. Life is a journey from birth to death. And why are you here? This is the classical question of humankind. Why am I doing here? I ask myself many times this question, and I don't know the answer. I had many answers. Instead of asking, what are you doing here? Probably it's better to change and, and be more affirmative and say, I'm here, period. 
Therefore, what shall I do to justify my presence here? And by the Vivia Piedra, this book is about justifying your presence. I mean, I as a writer, I'm sharing my questions and my, not my answers, but my questions on our being here, the fact that we are here and that we have to do something. And basically pulling our own weight. Absolutely. <laughs> I think that if you do something, do it with love. Don't spend your days trying to kill time. Time is going to kill you at the end. Don't worry. But if you are here, you are here. And be here and be here now because this present moment will never go back. Uh, so I'm giving this interview to you now and to your listeners. I'm totally here. I'm trying to tell things that are important to me. I'm not thinking, oh, what are the consequences? How, what shall I answer to this question? Blah, blah, blah. You don't think in advance uh, how we are going to answer the questions. You are somehow diving deep in your soul and getting the answers. And that's why this interview is entertaining also for me because I'm looking to myself, discovering myself 24 hours a day. And I am so blessed that you chose me. I love it. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> I love your presence here. Also. And I wanted to ask you something that you wrote that touches me every day, and I remind myself of it every day. It went something like this. You said, when you love and you love freely, you don't try to encapture that individual. On the contrary, you set him or her free. And by setting that love free, if it's yours, it will return to you. And I thought, oh, how lovely. It's like releasing a bird from its cage. This is the main frame of one of my books, the second best-selling book in my career, called 11 Minutes. I always thought about writing on sex. And uh, I said, one day I'm going to write a book on sex because sex is so important to our lives and I never understand why. But I could not get the guideline because I was already 40-something and, of course, your perspective on sex when you're older are totally different than when you are uh, 20, 23, 24. So you're seasoned. Now you're mature. Now your perspective yeah. is perfect. Yeah, yeah. But then this is also a problem to write a book because you cannot write a book from this perspective. You should write a book with the same questions that you had when you were 20 years old. Why? And then why? Because sexuality is something that evolves with you. So you have to go and to see your journey towards that. And one day I was in uh, returning from Davos, that it is, um, there is a gathering once a year, a summit that's called the World Economic Forum. And there was this prostitute that was a reader of mine. And she said, oh, can I talk to you? I said, oh, I'm very busy. What do you do? I asked her. She said, I'm a prostitute. I said, oh, yeah. How interesting. <laughs> she, yeah. And then she said, you know, there is a street here. And all the prostitutes are also your readers. Would you mind to go there? And I said, why not? Why not? Did and, you go? And so, of course. Of course, I went with some friends. And then we organized a signing session there. And I, I signed books for all of them. And I started re hearing their stories. And I said, this is the guideline of the book. Of course, the next day after I went to this red light district, I was horrified. I said, "My God, I'm 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 returning from this this uh, summit, economic summit, where I went to talk about culture, and I went directly <laughs> to this red light district." <laughs> <laughs> So I called my wife and I said, Christina, you know, and one of these two friends was a journalist. And I said, Christina, I went to this uh, red light district and and, 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 uh, and I was with a journalist. And she said, Paul, are you the Pope? I said, no, I'm not the Pope. I said, no, no, here. If you were the Pope, that would be a big deal. But as you are not the Pope, don't worry, you know. And, and then by hearing the stories of these girls, and having this girl as the main guideline, I could write a book on sexuality, but that goes from the most inhuman sexuality like you have when you pay for sex 
up to what it is in the heart of this prostitute, that it is always looking for love, looking for love. And then I wrote 11 minutes. I do believe that if you love, you have to set the person free. And freedom is the key of love. When you don't do that, it is because you are so insecure and you don't deserve to love. I agree. I absolutely agree. That's why everyone I ever love, I set them free. (laughs) (laughs) Which surprisingly, they all still love me after many years. Because, you know, you have a relationship that blossoms and it goes through its phases and just settles nicely. The same for me. Not only I love the people that I loved before, but I am always there for them. Because if you shared important things like love or making love, etc., you just can't say, okay, goodbye, let them move on. They are still there, and you should be also still there for them. Is there anything you want to tell your readers? Be brave. Don't be intimidated. There is only one quality that we can have in this life, is courage. Uh, This is the first quality that we need to have, either for the spiritual quest or for any quest in life. Uh, Be brave does not mean don't don't be afraid. Fear is part of our lives. I think that we can be afraid, like I'm afraid many times. But then I overcome my fears because I think there are something more important beyond this barrier of fear. And I try to behave like this, and I wish I could tell to my readers, don't be intimidated. Society is very intimidating, but move beyond. Be yourself, and at the end of the day, they are going to respect you. This happened to me. As I said before in this interview, I was institutionalized, I was in in a prison, I was tortured, but I never said to myself, you, Paulo Coelho, you are a victim. We are not victims. We are adventurers that are fighting for something that is important to us. We are adventurers who are trying to find a treasure So this is what we are doing. Yeah, yeah, be brave. That's wonderful. And I'm going to say it on the air now that everyone knows my passion for continuing to work with China, and I'm saying it to verbalize it, to materialize it, and visualize it. I will work in China, absolutely. (laughs) And I hope that sooner uh, than later. I'll be peddling Paulo Coelho's books. (laughs) (laughs) Yes, I will. (laughs) Good, good. I can't thank you enough for the courtesy and for taking the time, especially when everyone said to me, Paolo Coelho's not doing interviews, and I refused to give in to that. And one day, there they were, saying, when do you want to do it? You know, you see, this is how the universe uh, works. Absolutely. Uh, It works for me, and it works for Paolo Coelho, and it works for everyone I know that has faith in it. It really does. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Thank you very much for this interview. Thank you for allowing me this opportunity. To, and to the next time. Yes, the next time when we play this broadcast. Perfect. Perfect. You just tell me, you just confirm. I hope. I really hope to meet you. You look like a very interesting woman. <laughs> Thank yeah, you. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. I'm a pioneer. I like to try new things. When everyone said, you can't work with domain names, that's all I have to hear. If I hear no, that's a challenge for me. Great, 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 great. And I great. did. And many of the people who started with me, eventually they disappeared. But what happened? <laughs> people disappear. Yeah. yeah, they're all gone. And I'm still here working with syndicated news. And uh-huh. as you know, Google left China. I know, I know. And Network Solutions and GoDaddy had to leave as well. But I am going to open my arms to the universe and see what project and what we're going to be doing in Hong Kong because we will be working in Hong Kong and great. in mainland China. Great, great, great. I don't know what. Yeah, and let's do something together also. Yes, huh? that's my plan. And if someone wants to do something in China, call me. <laughs> <laughs> I love you. I love you. I really love you. You're the shameless promoter. (laughs) 
Great, 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 great. And I'll say now what I said 11 years ago. I apologize to no one for trying to earn a living and building business. Ah, perfect. Like I like normally I do also. I apologize to no one. Okay, so I have to talk to my publisher in Brazil. Yes, Pablo. And I'm looking forward to meet you personally. And you're going to contact me to... It is already in my agenda, but just to fine-tune the details, of right? Of course, of course. Okay. Thank so you so big, much for your wonderful kiss. spirit, and it's been a great interview. We've enjoyed you so much. Thank you. Absolutely. This is great. You are going to put this in, so I can also start promoting with my close to five of million. Of course. Weeks. So a big kiss. May God bless you, and we talk to each other. Um beso uh, y un abrazo. Un beso y un abrazo. Más besos que abrazos. Exacto. Eh? Exacto. Vale. Hasta luego. Hasta luego. Chao. Chao.